And David, David Wood, please open with your 10 minute opening comments. Thank you, Chris. And uh, I'd especially like to thank Shabir. Um, every Christian debater I know regards Shabir as the best Muslim debater in the world. So I look forward to these exchanges. Uh, Christians and Muslims agree on a number of issues. We agree that God created the universe, that uh, God has sent prophets, that God has revealed scriptures, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus performed miracles, and so on. But one of the most glaring disagreements between Christians and Muslims is the Christian claim that Jesus is the Son of God. A good Quran verse to illustrate the Islamic position is Surah 9, verse 30. And the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before. May Allah destroy them how they are turned away. Now, some alarms should go off when we read this verse. The verse begins by saying that Jews call Ezra the son of Allah. Jews do not call Ezra the son of Allah. The verse goes on to say that when Jews call Ezra the son of God and Christians call Jesus the son of God, we're imitating those who disbelieved before. But are we imitating someone here? The Christians wake up one day and say, wow, we really need to be more like the polytheists. No, Christians have no choice but to call Jesus the son of God because Jesus was identified as the son of God by an unparalleled cloud of witnesses. Let's consider a few of these witnesses. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, here's what happened next in Matthew 3. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. A voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, which means that the voice was the voice of the Father. But how do we know whom the Father was talking about? How do we know he wasn't talking about John the Baptist or someone else? Well, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven and landed on Jesus. Notice the Father and the Holy Spirit together identify Jesus as the Son of God. And Jesus repeatedly identifies himself as the Son of God. At his trial, for instance, in Mark 14, the high priest asks him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus answers, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the, at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in complete agreement that Jesus is the Son of God. In Luke 1, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall, call, and you shall name, name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Jesus is to be called Son of the Most High, according to Gabriel, chief spokesman of the angels. What about the prophets? John the Baptist was a prophet, according to both Christianity and Islam. In John 1, he talks to his followers about Jesus and declares, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. That's the testimony of the prophets. How about Jesus' apostles? At the end of John 1, the apostle Nathanael says to Jesus, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. In Matthew 16, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Peter answers, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, if Jesus is just a prophet, this is a really good time to rebuke Peter. Instead, Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In Matthew 14, Jesus walks on water during a storm. After stepping into the boat, the wind stops, and the disciples bow down and worship him, crying out, You are certainly God's Son. But it's not just his male followers who call him the Son of God. In John 11, Lazarus dies, and Martha, the sister of Lazarus, meets Jesus on his way to raise Lazarus from the dead. We read, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Martha and the apostles and John the Baptist were all Jews, but even some of the Romans called Jesus the Son of God. When Jesus died by crucifixion, there was an earthquake, 
And the Roman centurion and those who were with him shouted, truly, this was the son of God. Interestingly, demons would even call Jesus the son of God as he was casting them out. This is from Luke 4. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. Demons also were coming out of many, shouting, you are the son of God. The only first century witnesses who denied the sonship of Jesus were people who rejected him. But even the Jewish leaders who rejected him admitted that he was claiming to be the son of God. When they brought Jesus to the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate for execution, they said to Pilate in John 19, we have a law and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. Now think about the diversity of witnesses we have here. The father identifies Jesus as the son of God. Jesus identifies himself as the son of God. The Holy Spirit identifies Jesus as the son of God. The angel Gabriel identifies Jesus as the son of God. The prophet John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the son of God. Jesus' apostles identify him as the son of God. Martha identifies him as the son of God. The Romans identify him as the son of God. Demons identify him as the son of God. So why don't Muslims believe this cloud of witnesses? Well, six centuries after, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, angels, demons, men, women, Jews, Gentiles, united in a chorus of affirmation, Muhammad received a revelation. Surah 6, verse 101. Wonderful originator of the heavens and the earth, how could he have a son when he has no wife? So Allah can't have a son because he has no wife. Once again, some alarms should be going off. Readers of the Quran will recall that Mary raised the same objection when Gabriel informed her that she would have a son. She said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? Allah replied, it's easy for me. So it's easy for Allah to make a son without two parents, without any sort of sexual encounter. But by the time we get to Surah 6, revealed just a little later, it's suddenly impossible for Allah to have a son without having sex. How could he have a son when he has no wife? Apart from this, the author of the Quran simply has no clue what Christians mean when we call Jesus the Son of God. The phrase Son of God has a variety of meanings in the Bible, some of which can be applied to others besides Jesus, and some of which apply uniquely to Jesus. But the one thing the phrase son of God never means is that God had sex and produced an offspring. And yet, according to the Quran, that's the only thing the phrase can possibly mean. Since the author of the Quran doesn't even know what Christians believe, I find it very difficult to take the Quran's criticisms of Christian doctrine seriously. But Muslims take these criticisms seriously, so they're forced to say that all of the earliest sources on the life of Jesus have been corrupted. There are two problems here. First, we have an unbroken chain of testimony going back to Jesus' followers. We know what they believed. We know they believe that he's the son of God. Jesus was a prophet of Islam and his closest followers, after listening to him for years, walked away calling him the son of God. He must have been the worst communicator in history. Second, the Quran affirms not only the inspiration, but also the preservation and authority of our Christian scriptures. The Quran orders Christians to judge by the gospel. The Quran says we have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the gospel and the other revelation that has come to us. The Quran appeals to our scriptures to show that Muhammad was a prophet. The Quran says that Allah protected Jesus' true followers until they became uppermost over those who rejected Jesus. For Allah to praise our scriptures and the early Christians like this when he really means that our scriptures have been corrupted and the early Christians were infidels, he would have to be an even worse communicator than the Islamic Jesus, who's only a prophet but accidentally convinces everyone that he's the son of God. One minute. So if we really want to know who Jesus is, we simply can't trust what the Quran says. But we can trust the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the angel Gabriel, and John the Baptist, and the many others who repeatedly identify Jesus as the Son of God. Okay. About 40 seconds of spirit. Thank you, David. I'm quick. Uh, Dr. Sabir Ali, uh, we will reset the clock, and uh, we will uh, give you that cue. And if you're ready, you can start right now. Sure. 
Uh, hello everyone, I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and asking to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers. I want to thank all of the people who made it possible for me to be on this program here today. I thank David Wood for agreeing to uh, be with me on this panel, and Chris Conway, and uh, the organizers of uh, ABN and Trinity Ch Channel. Uh, now, as for the topic, uh, David has given you uh, an outline of the cloud of witnesses that are there in the New Testament. I'd like to start from a, from a historical uh, point of view and uh, uh, look at uh, the reasons for thinking that uh, all of these clouds of, th this cloud of witnesses uh, actually developed over time and this is not the original story. In fact, uh, in my presentation, I'll focus on three points. And uh, the three points I'll relate to the three letters of the first three letters of the word three. So T H R. Uh, I would say uh, T is for text, H for history, and uh, the R for reason. I would say that a text, history, and reason uh, combine uh, to give us a clear impression that Jesus, on whom be peace, never claimed to be God. It's not reasonable for him to be uh, God or to be the Son of God, and that Jesus himself never cl actually claimed to be the Son of God as well. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, that history uh, bears out that uh, the belief that Jesus was the Son of God actually developed over time. I want to start with the history as I indicated. Now, starting with the history, uh, when, when one looks back at who Jesus was, uh, as uh, uh, scholars generally recognize today, you have to understand Jesus from within uh, the perspective of the Jewish milieu in which uh, he was born and uh, raised. For example, I have a book with, uh, uh, by, by James Charlesworth uh, entitled Jesus Within Judaism. Uh, he uh, shows us that in Judaism, uh, it, it was common to uh, call God uh, uh, Father and uh, also uh, to recognize that there are many uh, important biblical figures who are referred to as the Son of God, and God referred to them as his son. God called David his son, God called Solomon his, his son. And it would be later that Christians would take the same sayings. When, For, for example, God uh, refers to uh, David as a son. Christians would take that same statement and say that uh, God referred to Jesus as his son, especially at the scene of the uh, baptism. But originally that statement actually referred to David. So David was... Uh, and not our David here, but David in history, uh, was the o o God's uh, begotten son. So now if uh, David was God be God's begotten son, and now Jesus is God's begotten son, now we have two begotten sons, and how could Jesus be the only begotten son? See, it doesn't make sense. What makes sense is to recognize that in history, people began to exaggerate the position of Jesus. First, they, they called him son of God in the sense in which Jews might refer to their prophets and heroes as sons of God, uh, in the metaphorical sense. I, I I don't think Muslims have any great objection to that. Uh, but then, uh, this term, son of God, means different things to different people. Some people started to think that, okay, he's son of God by adoption. You know, when God declared that he is the son, well, then he becomes the adopted son of God, special. Uh, not just in a symbolic or metaphorical sense, but in a very real sense. He's the adopted son of God. And then, if he is adopted son of God, when does that adoption take place? Is it uh, at the baptism scene, or is it by the resurrection from the dead that he's declared to be the Son of God? When does the declaration come? So there are different uh, ways here of conceiving of this. But now, uh, the, the further stage is to consider him uh, not uh, merely by adoption, the Son of God, but uh, by eternal generation as the Son of God. And uh, in that case, we have him as God and part of the Holy uh, Trinity as an emerging uh, doctrine. So this take, uh, takes time over the centuries to evolve like this. And Christians uh, continue to refer to Jesus as the Son of God, even though they have actually promoted him to Godhead. And you can't have it both ways. Uh, my son is not me, and, and God's son is not God. Uh, so you have to decide, do we want him to be the Son of God, or do we want him to be God himself? And uh, because that leads to a certain degree of confusion, as we will point out more in detail as we come to reason, uh, Christians uh, generally just say that he's the Son of God. But if pressed, they will say, yeah, he's God as well. But then th that requires an explanation. How can you have God the Father and God the Son and not have two gods? Hence the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, which uh, turns out to be very difficult to explain. Uh, so, so that's the history. So all of these writings that David has been quoting from um, are, are developed throughout history. And he has quoted a lot, for example, from the, 
gospel according to John, uh, without often saying that he's quoting from that gospel. Now, we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is said to be the earliest of the four. And if you go from Mark to John, you will see tremendous changes. Uh, it is only in the gospel according to John that Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God. Uh, so that, that's a very specific uh, doctrine. It is only in the gospel according to John that uh, we have that Jesus is the word of God. Uh, it is only in the gospel according to John that we have it that you can pray in Jesus' name, which is very common in Christian practice today. Now, even in Mark, yes, we have statements which uh, elevate Jesus uh, beyond what Muslims would agree uh, that he was. But as John Bowden has pointed out, just as we see uh, the development from Mark through Matthew and Luke and then finally to John, uh, we should uh, estimate that Mark himself developed the story. Mark does not give us the original bare facts, but his work is also a theological document giving us Christian theology by modifying the facts. And we can see the modifications made by the later writers, by, by Matthew and Luke and by John, by comparing them with Mark. If we had Mark's predecessors, we can make the similar comparisons and see that Mark himself has developed the story and changed it from the way in which Jesus uh, spoke about himself. And in fact, we do have some indications of what was there before Mark, but not a fully uh, a, a documented gospel as we have in, in the later gospels. Uh, so that note of precaution has to be kept in mind that Jesus himself did not preach him to be this, that he was the son of God, but he was made later on uh, to be that. So that's the historical perspective. As for the texts, uh, when the texts are looked at more carefully, we see that in the Old Testament, there is no text that indicates that God has an eternally begotten son. In fact, uh, David was even talking about the Holy Spirit and saying the Father and the Holy Spirit, as though these are two separate persons. But as James Charlesworth has mentioned in another book, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, it was never in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit is spoken of as a, as a separate uh, person uh, from the Divine uh, Father. Uh, so you didn't have like God and Holy Spirit as two, and then we're waiting for the third to be revealed. Uh, we, we had just simply one God, and the Holy Spirit was spoken of, of like, as the power of God that influences actions in the world or persons who will act in the world in a particular way. So again, we're seeing a developed doctrine and the texts of the, of the Bible do not actually support this. For the New Testament to be true, it has to agree with the old. As uh, James White said in, in his book, The God Who Justifies, there is only one God. And the God of the New Testament is identical to the God of the old in, in every way. So you cannot have a new God in the New Testament. You have to have the same old one uh, God. And uh, by introducing Jesus as the Son of God, as the only eternally begotten Son of God, leading to the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, this introduces another God, and you can convince yourself that they are just, uh, the three are just one God, but uh, we will see how interesting the discussions on that will unfold, and whether that is really convincing. So finally, on the point of reason, uh, if you have three gods, you have Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, uh, then this is not acceptable to Christians. Christians say they're not three gods, they're three persons sharing the same one God, the same divinity. But how can you explain that? It looks like this is just sophistry designed to hide the fact that in fact by adding the Son you have added another God and then by declaring the Holy Spirit as a separate uh, individual who can be worshipped in his own right, uh, this uh, is a third God and you're just trying to, uh, to um, use sophistry to, uh, to, to make it look as though you have only one God. Now where does the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace come in in all of this? He has a revelation from the Almighty God to call us back to the pristine monotheism. That is the monotheism of Jews and of the early Christians, where we have only one God. You can call him Father, Muslims do not, but that's mentioned in the Old Testament, and that's not where our quarrel lies. But, uh, our quarrel uh, between Muslims and Christians is uh, in the fact that Christians have taken uh, Jesus to be the eternally begotten Son of God, and that led to them declaring him to be fully God, and hence the unfolding of the doctrine of the Trinity. But if you... Uh, Father, Son, uh, Father is God, Son of God, and the Holy Spirit is God, it looks like you have three gods. Then what about the Son himself? Uh, if the Son uh, is begotten by the Father, now theoretically he can be beget his own sons and daughters as well. And uh, in fact, you can have multiple persons in the Godhead. And uh, the Trinity does not really deal with this. There's no verse in the Bible that limits the persons of the Trinity to exactly three. 
uh, there was a verse in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, but that verse has now been revealed from modern translations of the Bible because that verse has been uh, declared by the Christian scholars to be a forgery in, into the Bible. And so once that is removed, we have a Bible that does not tell us that the total number of persons in the, Holy Tr uh, in the Godhead is only three. So theoretically, you can have uh, Jesus having his own sons and daughters, and you have a multiplicity in that unity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chris, and thank you again, Shabir. Uh, in my opening statement, I pointed out that everyone who could possibly identify Jesus as the Son of God identified him as the Son of God, the Father, Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit, that's the whole Trinity, uh, the angel Gabriel, John the Baptist, Jesus' disciples, Martha, some Romans, and even demons all agreed that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what we read in our earliest records of the life of Jesus. Now, as a Christian, I believe that uh, since Jesus lived the most miraculous life in history and rose from the dead, he obviously has God's stamp of approval on his message. But I tend to trust God's power more than our Muslim friends do. If God is miraculously affirming Jesus' message and authority, God obviously wants people to pay attention to that message. And if God wants that message to get to us, the message is going to get to us. So when I read the first century sources, I take them seriously. Our Muslim friends, I think, have a much lower view of God. They believe that God is powerful enough to perform miracles, but not powerful enough to protect Jesus' message from corruption. Allah says in the Quran that he gave the gospel as a guidance to mankind, and he promised to protect Jesus' followers. But when it came time to protect that gospel and to protect those followers, our Muslim friends tell us that Allah stood by helplessly as the message and the followers were corrupted. Now, Shabir has uh, given us his reasons for um, objecting to the sonship of Jesus. A lot of it is based on the idea of an evolution of the doctrine that at first uh, Jesus was only identified as the Son of God in some merely human sense that would apply to other people, and later he was identified in some greater sense. Uh, so I should say a few words, I think, here about what Son of God means in the Bible, because we see from uh, Zachar Naik and... Uh, and the, the late Ahmed Didat that uh, many Muslims think that since other people are called the Son of God, therefore it's, uh, it's not very important when Jesus is called the Son of God. Uh, so, uh, Shabir points out that in Judaism it was common to call God Father uh, and that other people could be Son. So, what does the phrase Son of God mean in the Bible? Well, it can actually mean several different things, some of which, again, apply to others besides Jesus and some which apply to Jesus. Um, let's go through a few of the important ones. First, human beings in general are called children of God in Acts 17. Uh, Paul tells us why, because in him we live and move and have our being. In other words, since God is the source of everything we have, even our existence, he's our father in that sense. Uh, so that's human beings, but spirit beings can also be called uh, son of, sons of God, not only because God creates them and sustains them, but presumably because they carry out a role in uh, carrying out God's commands. Third, the nation of Israel, again, is uh, called God's son. In Exodus 4, God tells Moses to say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And here uh, you can see a kind of pattern in that when something is brought about by God, uh, that he can be called the father, in a, in a sense, because he's the one who's, who's producing this. Fourth, the reigning Davidic king, the king who was a descendant of King David, was called son of God because he was put on his throne by God, and he was to rule under God's authority as God's representative. Fifth, and this is a, a very different sense, people who reflect God's will through their conduct can be called sons of God because of a kind of family resemblance with the will of God. So Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. So those are the various senses and according to Shabir, these are the sorts of things that people would be thinking of in the earliest text when they identify Jesus as the son of God. Now, I, I, I take I take the New Testament as inspired, but if we want to be critical, then the, the critical method would be to identify the earliest sources and to distinguish the sources within the sources. And here, scholars would reduce these to uh, Mark, to the Q, hypothetical Q document, to M, that's the unique material in Matthew, uh, to L, that's the unique material in Luke, and you can also uh, have John and Paul as well as our earliest material. Uh, 
I mean, of, of varying degrees of how close they were to the, to the life of Jesus. But our earliest sources, of course, um, would be uh, Mark and Q and Paul, but in all of those sources, you have Jesus identified as the Son, and it's in, a, it's in a divine sense. So notice, I quoted the Gospel of Mark when Jesus is walking on water, and his disciples bow down and worshiping, saying, he's God's Son. I don't think they mean, uh, you know, you're, you're a son of God in, in like the sense that all human beings are the Son of God. They mean something more if they're bowing down and worshiping him, calling him God's Son after walking on the water. Uh, so you have, you, that, that's clearly a pretty exalted sense of son of God, if they're worshiping him in connection with this. Uh, we also have Q, but we can identify material that is in this early source, and that would include uh, Jesus saying, all things have been handed over to me by my father, and no one knows the son except the father, nor does anyone know the father except the son, and anyone to whom the son wills to reveal him. So this is clearly, clearly not the same sense as some of the other senses that apply to human beings. And when you go through Jesus' claims, you can go through any of these sources, M, L, Q, Mark, any of these, and you find Jesus being called the Son of God in a divine sense. So Shabir is simply incorrect that uh, in the earliest sources he would be identified as a mere human being, and later, uh, later we have an evolution. Jesus is Son of God from the beginning. But to go back to Shabir's points here, One minute. Muhammad brings us this pure monotheism, but, but the, the Muslim sources repeatedly tell us to go to the gospel. And if it's in all of our sources, if, the, if Jesus as son of God in a divine sense, not a merely human sense, is, appears in all of our sources, then if that's wrong, then the gospel message has been corrupt from the beginning. Allah should be telling us, whatever you do, don't go to that message. But when we go there, we find Jesus as the Son of God. So the only choice would, to be complete, would be to be complete skeptics to say we can't know anything. All of the Christian sources have been corrupted and are unreliable. But this would be to say that God, who gave Jesus this miraculous life, and Allah, who promised, promised that he would protect Jesus' true followers until the day of resurrection, that this God failed tremendously, he could not protect it, and Jesus' message was corrupted from the time it was written down, and that Muhammad is later affirming that message, even though it's been corrupt. This, this is just complete incoherence, and that's why I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, Dr. Shapir, we are resetting the clock for seven minutes, and this will give you a chance for your first rebuttal, and you can start right now. <laughs> Okay, so uh, David has mentioned some very interesting points which I'd like to uh, respond to. He said that uh, in, in the Quran, uh, we, we read that uh, God cannot have a uh, son because he has no wife. But what he's missing is that the Quran is rejecting many different ways of speaking of Jesus as the son of God. The Quran is saying uh, God does not have a, a, a son like the ways in which people have thought that God would have a wife and have a son uh, through that wife. Uh, God does not even adopt a son. Ittakhada is the Arabic word which means adoption. He does not uh, adopt a, a, a son. Uh, and it even says, he, he does not have a son, simply put. Uh, so the, from the Quranic perspective, God has no son. Now what's the problem with uh, declaring that, uh, that Jesus is the son of God? Is that uh, some people may actually think that uh, there is a feminine uh, aspect to the deity and somehow the, the two of them, male and female, produce a, a third, which is the son. In fact, uh, Margaret Barker in her book, Christmas, the Original Story, has pointed to an early belief among some Christians uh, that the Holy Spirit was feminine and uh, th 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 somehow that uh, there is a feminine uh, aspect to deity in heaven. And some of this seems to be reflected in the book of Revelation where there is a woman in heaven who gives birth to a, to a child. Uh, so to avoid all of these complications and uh, possible uh, theo theological incorrectness, uh, the Quran just teaches Muslims simply, don't say that God has a son, go back to the original way, which is in the Old Testament where uh, there, there is no son for God. Notice that David just spent a lot of time showing the different ways in which in the Old Testament the son of God is used. But not on one of these ways did he identify that the Son of God in the Old Testament is used for an, uh, a, a somebody who is eternally begotten of God? 
So the son of God is angels, even down to the Davidic king, but never one who is ontologically the son of God from all eternity. So I think that is entirely lacking in the Old Testament, and it uh, points to a major gap in uh, Christian uh, thinking. So when the Quran says judge by the gospel, it doesn't say the entire gospel as it is now. It says, Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed therein. So it's not by the entire gospel that they hold in their hands, but by that which God has revealed uh, within those books that they contain. So we have to do some work of uh, sifting between what is the original revelation and what is later addition and uh, accretion and misinterpretation put there into the, into the document. And yes, God promised to uh, protect the true followers of Jesus and make them uh, uh, zahir uh, over the, the others, uh, uh, apparent that their truth should be apparent and clear. And uh, we see in this that the Quran has a great degree of tolerance. So we, in our small minds, cannot, expect, uh, cannot accept people having slight differences from us. But the Quran, uh, given by God Almighty, uh, comes from that wisdom of God, which knows that human beings are human beings, will differ about a number of things. But God accepts human beings as they are, even with some of their errors, until he outlines the way for them to uh, have a better way forward. So for many centuries, uh, Christians uh, followed the Nicene uh, Creed before the revelation of the Quran, but once the Quran is revealed, now they, everyone is expected to go by for God's final revelation. It's almost like St. Paul himself in one of his letters saying that God has excused uh, many uh, uh, incorrect actions by pagans in the past, but now that the revelation has come through Jesus Christ, now people are expected to follow Jesus. Similarly, we understand that when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has come, people are expected to follow this uh, final uh, prophet. So uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in communicating to us the Quran, actually gave us that original truth, uh, which was there from uh, the beginning. Uh, David is saying that uh, the earliest records, uh, being Mark and Q and Paul, point to Jesus' divinity. But he has not answered my, uh, my objection to that, which is that John Bowden in his book, Unans Jesus, the Unanswered Questions, has pointed out that even Mark uh, would have been based on earlier sources, and uh, Mark also uh, he evolved uh, the doctrine and, and represented that in the particular way in which he does in his gospel. And Paul, uh, Paul is not the earliest uh, witness to Jesus. The original disciples are. And in fact, uh, as G uh, James Dunn pointed out in his book, uh, Unity and Diversity in the New Testament, uh, some early Christians regarded Paul as an apostate and they regarded G uh, Peter as the champion of the faith. And they knew that there was uh, a, a sharp contrast between the teachings of Peter and the teachings of Paul. So where are the teachings of Peter? We don't have his original writings. We have two letters named after him in the New Testament. But as for the second, Christian scholars generally say that this is not uh, a, a writing from, from Peter. It's actually forged in his name. And as for the first one, First Peter, scholars are divided. So we do not have anything dependably traced back to Peter as his original uh, uh, gospel or his uh, teachings. What about his sayings in Acts of the Apostles and that the sayings of other disciples in the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible? Christian scholars uh, generally say nowadays uh, that uh, these are not originally the speeches of the disciples. Luke, the author, has actually transformed these speeches and presented them in his own way. So we do not have actually the, uh, the absolute earliest records. What we do have uh, is the obvious uh, evolution in doctrine between the Gospels as that, we, that we now can see before our very eyes. And I've given some examples of this to show how the Gospel according to John has actually evolved the story. Uh, uh, let, let's think about uh, how things are represented in Mark some more and, and how they come to be rep misrepresented in the later Gospels. In the Gospel according to Mark, when uh, Jesus was uh, asleep on, on a boat, the disciples went to wake him up and they said, uh, Teacher, do you not care if we drown? But in, in the... <laughs> In Matthew's Gospel, they address him as Lord. Not only that, in, in the later Gospel, they know exactly what to do. They worship Jesus. Uh, so this is a later development from an original earlier story. So we can see case after case. If in Mark, people address Jesus as Rabbi, in the later Gospel, they address him as Lord. If they address him as teacher there, in the later Gospel, they address him as Lord. Uh, if in the previous Gospel, they rebuke him, in the later Gospel, they worship him. So this is a clear development in the story. It's not that we have, uh, like, 
uh, as if the angel Gabriel gave us a piece of writing that you're quoting the angel Gabriel. Uh, we are quoting people who wrote that the angel Gabriel said this, or John the Baptist said this. And these are later writings which have actually evolved the story. We need to get back to the original story, which shows that Jesus is a servant of God, a human being, and a prophet, not the Son of God. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sh uh, Shabir Ali. And take it away, David. All right, well, as I pointed out, I believe that Muslims have a much lower view of God's power than we do. Jesus is born of a virgin, according to Islam. Allah is powerful enough to do that. Uh, Jesus raises the dead and heals the lepers. He's powerful enough to do that. Instead of Jesus dying, he's rescued, taken to heaven. So God is powerful enough to do that. And the God who promises, who promises to protect Jesus' followers until the day of resurrection, the God who says that he gave the gospel, the Injil, as a guidance to mankind, he doesn't protect it, and all of our earliest sources are corrupted. So God is powerful enough to do all these things, but not get the message through in written form. Now, uh, Shabir says that the problem with uh, calling Jesus a son is that it implies some feminine aspect or something, but uh, I'd say the Quran is certainly inconsistent here. Chapter 13, verse 39 of the Quran, and chapter 43, verses 3 through 4, refer to the mother of the book. So there's, there's the book, and then there's the mother of the book, which is with Allah, in Allah's presence. So if this l sort of language is problematic, and Allah has, uh, has a mother of the book with him, imagine... You Muslims out there, imagine if someone claimed to be speaking for God and came to you and said, I'm going to refute your doctrine. You see, uh, Islam teaches that there's a mother of the book, and of course, who's the father then? Well, the father must be Allah, because it's the word of Allah. Therefore, Allah has sex with the mother of the book and produces the Quran as an offspring. You see how silly this is? Well, you would reject that. You would say, that's not what we mean. And I would agree with you, but that's what the author of the Quran sounds like he's saying. He, 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 re, he responds to our doctrines and doesn't seem to understand. He responds to the doctrine of the Trinity and doesn't know what we mean by the Trinity. And so it becomes very difficult to take these, uh, these positions seriously. Now, going back to the difficulty before us. So I, I showed that, you, I mean, you have Jesus as the Son of God in Mark. You have Jesus as the Son of God in Matthew and Luke. Uh, you have the, the Son of God and Q. You have it in Paul. Shabir uh, said that, that Paul isn't the earliest. I wasn't talking about the earliest people. I'm talking about earliest sources, and Paul is a very early source. And Shabir's position is Paul must have somehow corrupted this. We're actually going to have a debate on this tomorrow, so I'll save some of my comments for then. But just think about what he's saying. If God is doing all of these things in the life of Jesus, there's obviously a point to it. And it's like God is saying, look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing in the world. Look at all the great things I'm about to do based on Jesus. And then God just drops the ball and everything is corrupted. After saying he's going to protect Jesus' followers until the day of resurrection. After saying he gave the Injil as a guidance for mankind. And the only Injil we have, the only Injil we have is this corrupt thing that over and over again says that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. So we have no accurate text, according to Shabir. And what do we have to do? He says, well... When the Quran says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein, he's saying, we go to the Bible and we have to figure out the true parts. And of course, we're going to do that by going to the Quran. Uh, we're going to find out what, the, what agrees with Islam. So we have to assume that Islam is true, but that, that can't be what Allah is saying there. Why? Because just a few verses earlier, Allah asks Muhammad, why are the Jews coming to you for judgment when they have the Torah? So what's the message there? Jews don't need you, Muhammad. They have the Torah. If Allah really means uh, they need you to go and correct them about all the parts of the Torah that are wrong, that is a very strange way of saying it. And Allah says repeatedly in the Quran that he's perfectly clear. So if Allah, goes to, if Allah says to Muhammad about the Jews, they don't need you. They have the Torah. And then he immediately says about the Christians, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. And he says that we still read the gospel. And he says we have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and the rest of the revelation that has come to us. If he's really saying in all of that, your doctrines have been corrupted. Don't believe that book. Just go to the Quran and then use it to, to sift through all of the material. And again, that is a very, very strange way of saying it for someone who claims to be perfectly clear. If Allah really means what Shabir means, why didn't he just say that? Is Allah capable of saying, hey, guys, your, your book's really corrupted. It's really messed up. Uh, so don't go to that. Just go to the Quran. 
And I mean, at what point does a book become so corrupt that you no longer send people to, to it? You no longer tell people to judge by it. According to Shabir, Allah is telling us to judge by a book that repeatedly identifies Jesus as the Son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. Why not just throw it out? And there's not one critical word, there's not one word of criticism towards the gospel that I'm aware of in the Quran. I would invite Shabir to, to show us where he gets this corruption of the gospel in the Quran. Thank you, David. Uh, so that is the end of your second rebuttal, which was five minutes long. We're resetting the clock for Dr. Shabir Ali to start with his uh, the debate uh, rebuttal, and we are ready right now. <laughs> yeah, so uh, David, that's very interesting. Uh, David uh, is saying the, the Quran uh, refers to uh, the mother of the book, Umm al-Kitab, and that must uh, somehow uh, leave open the possibility for somebody to misconstrue this, although he uh, recognizes nobody does. Uh, and nobody does, David, because in Arabic we use uh, like mother of the cities uh, and so on. Uh, so it, it, it's, it, it doesn't lead anywhere. I think you're barking up the wrong tree there. It's a sign of desperation. Um, uh, now, uh, only the true parts of the Bible are, are, are to be followed. How can we know which are the true parts of the Bible? Do we have to uh, first uh, accept the Quran and then know? Well, that's a Muslim practice, to first know from the Quran and then go to the the Bible and see which parts agree with the Quran. But the Quran is not uh, necessarily demanding this of, uh, of non-Muslims. The Quran uh, knows already that uh, there are people who are studying and differentiating between what actually Jesus said and what other people said. For example, red letter editions of the, of the Bible are produced today because people recognize that there are things that Jesus said and then there are things that other people said about him. So it's important to keep that difference in mind. Moreover, scholars are working to try and retrace what was the earliest saying about Jesus. And it's not only modern scholars who are doing this. Uh, scholars throughout history have been trying to differentiate between what Jesus actually said and what people later on said about him. They try to differentiate between the canonical and non-canonical books to the best of their ability. Uh, but uh, we, the result of their work is before us and we can see that uh, they did not have the critical insights that we have today and they accepted things in the Bible which were not uh, original. For example, the writings of Paul. Uh, when we look at uh, what Paul was teaching, we see that Acts of the Apostles uh, uh, shows us that whereas the disciples disciples of Jesus were going about preaching that Jesus is the Messiah for many chapters, then suddenly Paul enters the picture and what is the first thing he does? He goes into the synagogue and begins to preach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So the disciples were teaching that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and now Paul says the Son of God in addition to the Messiah. Uh, so uh, this is what comes to be represented in the, in the Gospels which are, which are written by the church which accepted Paul. So that it, it's, it's the Pauline uh, Christians who produce the Gospels that we have, the Gospel according to Mark, for example. And so they follow Paul's teachings and they represent Jesus as the Son of God, but to get the material from Jesus' mouth to show that he's actually the Son of God, this is where the problem uh, lies. Mark has it that Jesus uh, was asked, are you the Son of the Blessed? And uh, David is saying, yeah, Jesus affirmed that. Uh, but that's not the only record of that saying. In fact, uh, in other Gospels, it is clear that Jesus said to the uh, high priest, uh, you are the one saying that, that I am. So he didn't even own up to it in a very clear manner. So you need some clear statement showing that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And this is what is actually uh, lacking. And not only Son of God in, in one of the other senses that David said is possible, but since so many senses are possible, David has to show us the one place where Jesus authentically said that Jesus is the Son of God in that ontological sense as eternally begotten from God. Moreover, he needs to show from the Old Testament that there was such a Son. Uh, one cannot just simply enter the picture. Otherwise, we have the possibility open that sons and daughters of God can pop up uh, all over the place in many different universes, even right now as, as we are speaking. Uh, now, he's saying that the Jews had, had the Torah, and the Quran is saying, well, let them judge by the Torah. That is because they were coming to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, hypocrit hypocritically asking, for, asking him for a judgment such that if they get it in, this favor, in their favor, they would accept it. If not, they would reject it. So the Quran is turning them back to their books. Why are you coming hypocritically asking a man whom you don't believe to be a prophet of God to give you a judgment from God, whereas you have a book that you consider to be the judgment from God? Why don't you apply the judgment from God? Why are you going through this? hypocritical uh, routine. Uh, now, 
uh, David is saying that uh, the Quran says that the Jews and Christians stand on nothing until uh, they follow the, the, the Torah and the Gospel, but you should read what follows then, uh, as he himself said in the, in the English, uh, uh, that which has been revealed to you from your Lord, and now that includes the Quran. So the Jews and Christians cannot just simply remain with the Torah and Gospel and say that we are following the Quranic dictate. The Quran is saying everything that has been revealed to you, and this is where Muslims excel in that uh, we believe not only in the Torah of Moses and the Gospel of Jesus, but also in the final revelation given uh, from God uh, to his uh, final prophet. So where does this final revelation say that the previous books have been corrupt? In, in several, there are several indications, and a, a clear text, for example, in the second chapter of the Quran, the 79th uh, verse, which says, Woe to those who write the book with their own hands, and then they say that it is from God to benefit uh, from it uh, a paltry sum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sbirelli and Dr. David. Would each of you have had 10, 7, and 5 uh, minutes each to uh, present your views and to rebut? And now we have what's called crossfire. Each of you will have one minute apiece. We'll do three separate rounds. So one minute, David, one minute, Dr. Shabir Ali, three times to, all to back to back to back. So we'll see how this goes. We've got the clock set. And David, you can start right now. Thank you, Shabir. Now, I wanted to touch on that last point you addressed. You point out that, uh, that people were said to have uh, written the text with their own hands. Um, I could write something right now and say that this is the Quran. Would, would that mean that the Quran has been corrupted that are, or that any Quran in the world has been corrupted? I, I don't see how. But if that means, it, as you know, this is addressing the Jews. And so I don't know. I ask for why that we would think that the gospel has been corrupted. But Continuing on in that same passage, Allah then goes on to say to the Jews, just a few verses later, then do you believe in part, in a part of the scripture and reject the rest? That is what, that is, uh, then what is the recompense of those who do so among you, except uh, the disgrace in the life of this world and on the day of resurrection, they'll, they shall be consigned to the most grievous torment. So here he says, are you just going to believe in parts of the book and not the others? But that's exactly what you're telling us to do with the gospel. Allah says this will get us sent to hell. Okay, great. We're going to reset the clock for one minute for Dr. Shabir Ali, and you can start right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, the word kitab can mean many different things within the Quran. Just as you said, the word son of God can mean many different things in, in the Bible. Now, sometimes the word kitab is referring to the original scripture given to the uh, Jews and Christians. Sometimes it's referring to what they have in their, in their hands. And when the Quran is saying to them, do you disbelieve in part of the kitab, and, and believe in part, it's, it's referring to the original scripture given to them. Uh, are you going to reject some of the commands of God and follow some others? Uh, you, you, they, they hear the Jews are, are told to be reflexive and think about what they're doing. Are they conceptually following part of the book and rejecting part, uh, even when they consider now they have the book in their own hands? So are, what do they do? Do they fall apart and reject some other part? Uh, when it comes to the gospel, it is clear from the Quran that Jesus is not the Son of God, and those who uh, say that he is, they are following the saying of disbelievers of old. Okay, we're done with round one of our crossfire. We're going to reset the clock, and David, you can start uh, right close to and right now. All right, Shabir, that, that's not what the verse is saying. Then do you believe in a part of the scripture and reject the rest? This has to be some text that they have in front of them. Do you believe in part of the scripture and reject the rest? Then what is the recompense of those who do so among you, except the disgrace in the life of this world, and on the day of resurrection, they shall be consigned to the most grievous torment? So Allah says, you can't take part of the text and then ignore other parts of the text. And you're telling us what this really means is that Jews are supposed to recognize that they have to ignore parts of their text and only accept other parts. That can't possibly be what it means. If it is, then Allah is a, just not a good communicator. And going back to what you said, that when it says the, the other revelation that has come to the Christians, but Allah distinguishes between the revelations given to the people of the book and to the Muslims. We believe in that which has reveal, be, been revealed to us and that which has been revealed to you. So there's a distinction there. So when he talks about the revelation that has come down to the Christians, that's the revelation we have. And this revelation says over and over again that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, halfway through, we're going to reset the clock. And uh, 
We'll give uh, Dr. Shapirelli a chance to re respond to that, and right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so David, as you press the point, we go more, more into detail in the scripture. In the Quran, the point that is being made to them is that uh, they were given a covenant from God that they are to uh, not uh, uh, drive people out of their homes and not attack them, uh, but uh, they, in fact, continue to do that. Uh, and when uh, they, even though they had uh, killed uh, some of their own people and driven them out of their homes, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, helping uh, others, they, they would say, okay, so we, we help others to do that, but we don't do it ourselves. So they are, in fact, following part of the scripture and disbelieving in part. So it's a specific commandment that the Quran was uh, speaking about. When it comes to the New Testament, uh, the original story about Jesus is that he was a prophet, a servant, a messenger of God. Matthew chapter 12 verse 18 shows that Jesus seconds. was a servant of God. And later on, Paul uh, changed that to make it be son of God, and that came to be represented in the later Gospels. Okay, great. We're going to reset the clock for our last round of our crossfire, and we can start right now. Now, Shabir, you, you keep saying that Paul invents this doctrine, the Son of God, because in Acts, he's the first person to say it. But you know as well as anyone that Acts is part two of Luke Acts and that Jesus is repeatedly identified from the first chapter as the Son of God in the book of Luke. Luke is based on earlier sources such as Mark and Q, in both of which Jesus is identified as the Son of God. So how can you say he's identified here as the Son of God, he's identified here as the Son of God, and then Luke draws on this material where he's identified as the Son of God, and then Paul in the book of Acts, which is the sequel, calls him the Son of God, therefore Paul invented it. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're going to say that, I mean, it's... I don't understand the method here. It seems like find something that I can, I can use for Islam and then ignore all the rest. And this is after Allah promises to, to protect Ten Jesus' seconds. followers and says that he has given the, the gospel as a guidance for mankind. It guided precisely no one, according to what you're telling me, and it was a guidance for mankind. Okay, we have one more of our crossfire, and we're going to start the clock right now. Okay. So what I'm saying, David, is that Luke is aware that Paul is the first person to preach this uh, doctrine, whereas the disciples of Jesus who were mentioned prior, prior to Paul entering the scene were preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. So where did Luke get this idea to, uh, to write it that the angel Gabriel said right from the very beginning of Luke's gospel that uh, Jesus will be called the Son of God? Well, we don't know. Luke doesn't tell us who his sources are. So these are unknown. In Arabic, we would say this is majhul, and we wouldn't accept such uh, a thing that has such great theological uh, significance. Uh, when the Quran is saying that, he, uh, that the previous uh, uh, followers of Jesus uh, would uh, be uh, overshadowing over their, their enemies, uh, it could mean many things. It could mean that God protected them as a group so they continue to believe in Jesus, uh, even if they had certain uh, misunderstandings about Jesus. But God accepts people as they are because they could not do much better at the time. That's the information that they had before them. Okay, great. Well, we're going to we thank you, gentlemen, for that very, uh, that's why we call it crossfire. Dr. Shabir, you've got it. Oh, we're going to reset the clock. Sorry. Let me, uh, re give me, uh, we're getting there. Okay, and right now. Uh, folks, uh, I had uh, summarized my presentation into three points. Uh, the T I said is for text, H for history, R for reason, the first three letters that spell the word three. And I said that the text of the Old Testament does not support the belief that there is an ontological, eternally begotten Son of God. Uh, and uh, to introduce one later is really to corrupt uh, the belief in, in the one God. Uh, second, I, I, sh I showed that uh, history uh, indicates that the belief in Jesus as the Son of God and as God developed over time. First, people took him as metaphorically Son of God, uh, which is fine with Muslims, uh, though Muslims would not say it that way. Uh, but our real uh, objection comes when people have said that he is the adopted Son of God, and then when, when adopted, and later on they said that he actually was eternally uh, begotten uh, by God. Even that came in two stages because uh, the first stage they said that uh, he became son of God when he was conceived in the womb of Mary and later on they projected that to back to all eternity. And it's in that idea that uh, God somehow was the father, Mary the, the mother, that uh, gives rise to some confusion in the minds of people thinking that there is a feminine aspect to the deity and uh, God uh, rejects that. Not because there's anything wrong with uh, having anything feminine to do with the deity but because there is only one God and he's referred to one way in the sacred scriptures and we should not refer to him uh, in another way. So I've shown that development and uh, uh, 
Uh, David has not been able to show that uh, we have documents uh, precisely from Jesus, precisely from John the Baptist, precisely from the angel Gabriel, uh, which say that Jesus is the Son of God. He's citing later documents written decades late, uh, afterwards uh, that say that John the Baptist said this or Gabriel said this and so on. Even Q it is written some 20 years after uh, Jesus and by some anonymous person. We don't know whom. So how can we cite that as absolute evidence that uh, Jesus said something? And uh, finally, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is a disputed point, which probably we'll have time to deal with uh, later. Uh, if, when the Gospels were written, they wrote from the perspective that Jesus actually rose from the dead, and they're trying to prove that to their audiences. Uh, but uh, uh, reading these documents carefully, one would see that, in fact, the story is convoluted and, in fact, uh, contrived, and that uh, the best indication is that Jesus did not actually die on the cross. Probably he expired on the cross, and he was put in the tomb, and from the tomb God raised him into heaven, and that would coincide with the Quran, which says that they were doubtful about the, uh, the belief that they actually killed uh, Jesus. And finally, it, it is uh, not outside of the power of God to preserve the gospel and to keep Christianity on, uh, on the pristine monotheism, but God does sometimes allow things, uh, he allows things to flow as they flow in history, knowing that he can correct it later in his own time, and he has corrected it now by giving us the Quran as the final revelation, which Muslims and Christians are all invited to follow. Thank you, Dr. Shabriali. I really appreciate your conclusion there and staying on time. And <laughs> we're resetting the clock and getting it ready for David. And we're nearly done with our first debate here this afternoon. So as soon as we get that clock ready, we're going to throw it to David. And we're getting close to right now. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This is 700 years before Jesus was born. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So you have here a son who is going to be the Mighty God. Now Shabir would interpret this in some other way because he's going to be interpreting this through Islamic lenses. I'm interpreting it through the lens of the teachings of Jesus. And so if, I'm, if, if it's okay for Shabir to go to the Quran and say, now I'm going to interpret in the light of the Quran, why wouldn't I interpret in the light of the words of Jesus? Now, of course, Shabir would say, but Jesus never made these sorts of claims. All our records say that he did. All, every possible source we can go to identifies Jesus as the Son of God. Shabir says, well, we don't know who wrote these. We don't know who Luke was going to. Luke specifically says he went to eyewitnesses. And Luke is just one of the sources. He's just one. And that's the point. It's everywhere. It's in all the sources to say that everyone's identifying Jesus as the Son of God and everyone got it wrong. You must, you have to view Jesus' disciples as the biggest bunch of failures in the history of humanity and Jesus himself as one of the biggest failures in the history of humanity. If Jesus couldn't choose, couldn't pick one single follower who would faithfully carry on his message and make sure that message got across, then what, what, what do you think of Jesus? And what do you think, his, think of his followers? And not only that, it's God who says he's going to be preserving this in Islam. God says he's the one who's preserving this. And Shabir says, yes, but God's very tolerant. And so he's going to let people, he's going to just let people completely corrupt Jesus' message like this? God's going to just allow people to corrupt after all the work Jesus did, right? Being born of a virgin, preaching Islam at birth, living this miraculous life, and then being rescued. And God's just going to say, oh, well, you know, give it some time. And even though they're going around saying Jesus is the divine son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead, I can put up with those sorts of differences. But the problem is, as time goes on, then instead of simply correcting that and saying those messages, those records have been corrupted and then correcting it that way, the same God who tells us Jesus isn't the son of God, he didn't, rise, uh, he didn't die on the cross, and he didn't rise from the dead, also tells us judge by the gospel. We have no ground to stand upon unless we stand seconds. upon the gospel, the Torah, and the other revelation that has come to us. Shabir says that means the Quran. Not in the Quran it doesn't. Again, it distinguishes between the revelation to the, to the people of the book and to the Muslims. So he's telling us, don't believe these things that Christians say, but you'd better judge by the texts that say these things. And that means Islam is simply incoherent. What do we do at the end of the day? We have to trust that God knows what he's doing. If Jesus has that kind of authority, we need to listen to him, and he claimed to be the son of God.